It was homecoming weekend at Rowan University, a time for celebration, football, campus activities, and of course, parties. In the electric glow of streetlights with the scent of bonfires lingering in the air and the sounds of students having the time of their life in the distance, one sophomore's life would be destroyed in a matter of seconds. 19-year-old Donnie Farrell was walking with a group of friends when five men approached. Asking where parties were, Donnie turned to point them out when suddenly two men struck. A quick punch dropped Donnie before he could even react. No one yet knew, but Donnie wasn't just hurt, he was dying. Just a few hours later, after emergency surgery and being placed on life support, he was gone. For police, armed with eyewitness accounts, surveillance footage, and the knowledge of a unique piece of clothing worn by one assailant, the hunt would cover multiple states, hundreds of interviews, and thousands of miles in pursuit of the men who robbed and murdered a 19-year-old all over a wallet and cell phone. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 157, The Murder of Donnie Farrell. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a case that's a little different from what we normally do, the story of Donnie Farrell and the mindless violence that took his life. Before getting into it, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 19-year-old Donnie Farrell was a sophomore at Rowan University with his whole life ahead of him. Then, faster than anyone could even react, a senseless act of violence ended that life and forever changed a university, a community, and a family. This is episode 157, The Murder of Donnie Farrell. It had been hours since the last raindrops had fallen, yet the brisk night air still carried a dampness that swept coldly along the skin with each breeze rising up from the west. The passing traffic mixed with the sound of music thumping in the distance created a muffled din as the musk of bonfire smoke stirred up with each whirling gust of air. The campus of Rowan University was alive with the lights and sounds of students gathered together for on-campus events and off-campus parties, as a dual celebration marked the weekend of homecoming and Halloween. Orange streamers snapped against fence lines, plastic skeletons crinkled as they danced along crisp winds. It was one of the busiest and most lively weekends of the year, and while Rowan had once sat amidst the quiet lull of lush farmland, urban expansion had consumed the greenery, asphalt and concrete reshaping the environment from that of a pastoral landscape to a busy city whose population had more than tripled in the previous four decades. Each year, the borough would experience a dramatic population shift. As the fall would begin, nearly 10,000 students came to the university, where they would intermingle with the local population of 20,000. Homecoming weekend always raised the stakes, with thousands more coming to town from nearby Philadelphia and neighboring schools and even as far away as New York City. Groups of friends, college age and beyond, would pile into the Glassboro area seeking out bonfires and parties, celebrating the evening's game, the coming holiday, or just looking for another college rager. In preparation for the influx, The school had increased the patrols of their security officers, as well as their armed campus police. While Rowan was noted as being a safe campus, there had been a few incidents in the previous months involving locals targeting students, which drew some concern over the security of such an open campus. For most students and visitors, they'd experience a weekend full of fun, laughter, and excitement. 
Tragically, though, a moment of violence would occur so rapidly no one could even react, and in a time frame of mere seconds, a 19-year-old sophomore would be left with his life on the line. The call had come in just after 9 p.m. A student walking with a group of friends had been assaulted and robbed. Less than two minutes passed before a police cruiser came screeching to a stop with lights whirling and sirens screaming to find the teenager already in the midst of receiving CPR. Over the course of the next ten minutes, his heart would stop twice and he would be revived twice. But by the time the sun came up the next morning, 19-year-old Donnie Farrell would be gone and the search for the men who had robbed him would become a hunt for the men who had killed him. Donald James Farrell III was born on Wednesday, January 20th, 1988, on Staten Island in New York, to parents Donald and Kathy. Donnie, as he was always referred to, was one of four children, having two sisters and one brother. Donnie's been described as being a fun-loving, always-smiling, sensitive, and caring child who was extremely close with his family and had an affinity for sports. While he spent the first years of his life growing up on Staten Island, his family would move to Morris County, New Jersey in 1995, when he was seven years old, settling into a home on North Main Street in Booton. Donnie would attend Rockaway Valley School, where his outgoing, fun-loving personality would help him quickly acquire a large group of friends. Noted as the type of person to get along with anyone, he never struggled to connect with his peers or his teachers who went on to describe him in such glowing terms as sweet, wonderful, brilliant, and on the right track. His love for athletics began early, with a particular interest towards baseball and lacrosse, both of which he would later excel in. Outside of sports, he was involved in a number of school organizations, extracurricular activities, and church programs at St. Catherine of Siena. At home, he spent a lot of time with his siblings, listening to music, playing catch, and according to neighbors, shooting hoops in the driveway with the family. Donnie would go on to Mountain Lakes High School, where he would continue to play baseball and lacrosse. Kevin Wallace, one of his coaches, would later describe him to the Daily Record as having great promise, both on and off the field, saying, quote, Donnie was a true teammate, all for the team. He really was an extremely coachable kid, the kind of kid that every coach wants on the team the true student athlete, end quote. Donnie wasn't just a great athlete because of his skill, which he had an abundance of, but it was also about the way he approached the game. He was the type who always wanted to do better and was readily available to help his teammates in working on their own abilities. Between school years, he'd dedicate much of his free time to working to improve his game when he wasn't working at the Deer Lakes Club, where he aided with all manner of maintenance tasks. He loved to play, but he always saw an opportunity for improvement. While a lot of kids his age didn't want to put in the work, he was all about it. Mike Carmichi, another of his coaches, later explained, quote, He showed a lot of promise and potential whenever I had the opportunity to work with him. Great attitude. More than anything above and beyond, that always exceeds talent in my book. The right frame of mind, the right work ethic. The fact that the kid wanted to better himself in the offseason attests to that. End quote. He carried that attitude and mentality off the field as well, being active in the Key Club, Physical Fitness Club, Christian Club, and the Student Government Association. He worked hard, put in all the effort he had, and was looking to build a bright and solid future. While teenagers have a tendency to drift off the straight and narrow to test the limits of the rules, Donnie never found himself getting into much trouble. As his former principal and family friend Lou Ludwig explained, quote, He was just a great kid. You never worried about him in terms of doing anything wrong here. He was always doing the right things. End quote. In his senior year, Donnie won an award for having the best attitude, work ethic, and dedication to his team playing center field wearing the number 23 in honor of his favorite player, Don Mattingly. Donnie worked hard with his name appearing in multiple papers, noting his large contribution to team victories. By the time he was graduating in the summer of 2006, he had developed a reputation as a skilled athlete, kind person, caring friend, and generally fun-loving guy. 
The amount of people who commented about his smile is overwhelming, this seeming to be his signature trait. Friend and former teammate Clayton Bott Wentworth told the record, quote, I thought of him as a mentor. He taught me more about life and how to appreciate it, probably more than the game itself. He always had a smile on his face no matter what, and when you heard his name, you'd smile too because you knew what a great guy Donnie was all the time, end quote. In the fall of 2006, Donnie would matriculate to Rowan University in Glassboro, located in South Jersey, a two-hour drive from home. While attending as a business major, Donnie still found time to play baseball and lacrosse, becoming a co-founding member of the lacrosse group. As he always did, he worked hard and found himself on the dean's list each semester. While a lot of college kids spend their free time, the first major free time they've had away from home, partying and enjoying the distance, Donnie was different. Sure, he enjoyed a party, but he missed his family as well and often rode home, telling them what he'd been up to and how things were going. He wasn't the type to skip weeks of contact or miss calls, but looked forward to catching up with the family. When he came home for visits on holidays and weekends, He was looking to spend time with everyone, whether it was hanging around the house or attending his younger sister's baseball games. For the most part, Donnie's freshman year went well, both in terms of athletics and scholastic achievements, but a violent incident in April of 2007 would change at least the way his family viewed that school. According to Noreen Cole of the Donnie Project, on Friday, April 20th, Donnie attended a party off campus on Old Heston Road. Accompanied by a group of female students who he didn't know very well, Donnie was involved in a verbal altercation at the party. The cause of the argument has never been firmly established, nor has the fight which occurred afterwards. As you might imagine, with a bunch of college students drinking, there are several different accounts of what may have happened. While Donnie's account explained that he had been attacked by a group of three guys, They would claim that after asking him to leave, Donnie had turned violent. Either way, police reports regarding the incident specify that one of the guys held Donnie by the back of the neck while another punched him in the face, resulting in several shattered teeth and a broken jaw in two places, so badly broken that it had to be wired shut. What exactly went down that night will probably never be known with 100% accuracy when you factor in that everyone involved was drunk, but it was enough for Donnie's family to feel that he'd been targeted. Police were involved in this incident, and while no one was indicted after a grand jury heard the evidence, the school did take disciplinary action against one student, the one who threw the punches, and he was suspended with a return based on probation. It should be noted that when asked, Donnie was unable to positively identify the person who had attacked him. As a result of these injuries, Donnie stayed home and commuted to school, driven by his mother, to finish up the last classes and final exams. Over that summer, his parents tried hard to get him to change schools, but he wasn't wanting to do that. Despite the assault, he enjoyed Rowan and made a lot of friends there. According to several of those friends, Donnie understood his parents' reticence but he wasn't about to allow the fight to change the perspective nor academic direction of his life. Tragically, his family's concerns about his safety would later be substantiated when Donnie was attacked and left for dead just two months into his sophomore year on Old Heston Road. Donnie's family would later file a lawsuit against the three men who had done the April attack, though it was settled out of court. For his sophomore year, Donnie lived in off-campus housing at the Beau Rivage Apartments, just two-tenths of a mile away. The early part of the semester went well with no incidents or problems, and definitely nothing close to what had occurred months earlier in April. Donnie continued to shine his signature smile, now having healed from the assault. Roommate Kevin Balderman would later describe Donnie to the record as, quote, just the kind of guy that loved life. He was one of the sweetest, most caring guys I've ever met, end quote. Tragically, everything would change on a cool homecoming weekend when Donnie once again found himself the target of a violent attack, one from which there would be no recovery. While Rowan was generally considered a safe campus with ample security, 
There had been several incidents in the weeks leading up to the attack on Donnie that gave some students reason for concern. In a story reported by the Daily Record, two students reported to campus police that on Tuesday, October 2nd, they'd been robbed at gunpoint by three assailants dressed in black at approximately 2 a.m. near the intersection of New and State Streets, just a few blocks off campus. Just over two weeks later, on October 19th, Friday, a Rowan student was attacked on Carpenter Street, which runs along the northeastern edge of campus. Reportedly, the victim was targeted by several individuals from the surrounding area. This was the fourth attack reported since the beginning of the fall semester. The fifth would turn deadly. While the school argued that incidents such as this were trending downward from previous years, Multiple students voiced concerns that due to the campus being so open, it wasn't uncommon for non-students to gain access to campus land, buildings, and housing, and they felt threatened by the possibility of both past and future attacks. Joe Cardona, a spokesman for the school, later told the Daily Record, quote, There's not more assaults than last year. The differences we're finding the few assaults we've had have been more violent. So far, the assailants haven't been Rowan students. End quote. The weekend of Friday, October 26th, was set for homecoming. This would bring about a number of activities held on campus, as well as multiple parties off and around campus. Some parties focused on homecoming, others Halloween, and others yet were parties purely for the sake of partying. While Friday seemingly went off without a hitch, it was Saturday where everything would change. Throughout the early part of the afternoon, Donnie reportedly hung out with a few different friends both on campus and at his apartment off Mullica Hill Road. That night, there was a party at the complex and Donnie attended along with a few friends. Sometime between 8.30 and 9 p.m., he exited the party and left the complex with that group that consisted of four females and one male. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer, this group was planning to make their way to another party, this one taking place on campus but they needed to stop off first. One member of the group wanted to run into the nearby Express Mart convenience store, located along State Route 322, Mullica Hill Road. Their path would take them southeast, across Joseph Bow Boulevard and Old Heston Road. All in all, it was just over 500 feet from the complex to the store. The Triad apartment building sits just a few yards behind the store, through a thin line of trees. Old Heston Road runs at an angle, 700 feet from the southwest where it meets Mullica Hill Road to the northeast where it connects to the parking lot for the Triad. At approximately 9.08 p.m., Donnie, along with three of his female companions and the one man, stopped on Old Heston Road adjacent to the apartments, while a fourth female ran into the store, reportedly to purchase plastic cups to bring to the party they were attending. The store was just 150 feet away. At this time, a group of five men slowly approached Donnie and his friends, coming from the direction of the convenience store, walking north. According to a Project Donnie article written by Cameron Meiswinkel, one member of the group asked if any of Donnie's friends were looking to buy Skittles, which investigators later said was a drug reference, but none in the group were interested. The same man then apparently asked, where the party's at. With this being a busy weekend, it wasn't uncommon for people to travel to the area looking to party. At first, Donnie and his friends gave out a handful of locations before Donnie eventually mentioned the party they'd just come from at the Beau Rivage Apartments. Now, what exactly happened next is somewhat difficult to nail down because there are two distinctly different accounts, one presented by most major newspapers, and one given by the Donnie Project through interviews with prosecutors. In the Donnie Project article, the man asked where the apartments were, and Donnie pointed towards the building just a few hundred feet away to the west. Allegedly, the conversation continued on beyond this for a moment or two, though according to the project, police will not reveal the details of what was said. Reportedly, at least one witness claims to have seen Donnie and the man shaking hands at the end of their conversation. The group then turned, heading north towards the Triad Apartments where they had parked their cars. Seconds later, at approximately 9.11 p.m., the man, who had been speaking to Donnie, came running up behind him, throwing a blindside punch the 19-year-old never saw coming. 
The point of contact is believed to have been where his jaw meets his neck. Donnie fell to the pavement, at which time a second man rushed in, kicking him in the stomach while he was on the ground. Donnie, unconscious and bleeding, could do nothing to defend himself as the assailants reached into his pockets, grabbing his wallet and cell phone before fleeing. Donnie's friends, which included his longtime girlfriend, had gotten a few yards ahead of him, turning in time to see the suspects robbing him, but they couldn't get to him before the group scattered. Witnesses reported that the attack was unprovoked and seemingly came out of nowhere, with everything happening so fast no one even realized what was going on until Donnie was on the ground. According to the Daily Record, Philadelphia Daily News, and The Inquirer, the attack occurred moments earlier. All major news articles report that as Donnie pointed towards the apartment complex where the party was, he turned his head towards it, at which time the suspect threw his punch, knocking Donnie to the pavement before he was kicked in the stomach and robbed. The variance in detail is likely accounted for by how fast everything happened and multiple witnesses experiencing things slightly differently. However it exactly went down, the result was the same. Donnie was lying face down on the pavement, though no one had any idea in the immediate aftermath that he was mortally wounded. The call came in to police at 9.13 p.m., and with the heightened security in the area for the busy weekend, the first police unit arrived in just 90 seconds to find Donnie unconscious and bleeding from the face and mouth. Rowan's students who were in the emergency medical technician program immediately discovered that Donnie wasn't breathing and began administering CPR. When police asked where the assailants had gone, no one knew for sure, as in all the chaos they'd focused on Donnie, rather than the fleeing suspects. However, some witnesses later reported seeing the group of men jumping into a dark-colored car parked near the convenience store and fleeing the scene. Donnie was in serious trouble and was loaded into an ambulance bound for Cooper University Medical Center in Camden, some 15 miles to the north. Donnie's girlfriend climbed into the ambulance along with him, not knowing how badly he'd been injured. During the course of the drive, which lasted between 10 and 12 minutes, Donnie suffered cardiac arrest and his heart stopped. EMTs managed to revive him, but minutes later, his heart stopped for a second time. Again, he was revived, but by the time they'd arrived at the hospital, he was considered to be in critical condition and emergency surgery was authorized. Around the time Donnie was being rushed into surgery, police were completing the process of taping off the scene and beginning witness interviews. Unfortunately, no one had directly witnessed what exactly occurred, nor did there appear to be any reason for the blatant assault outside of robbery. In regard to the suspects, the group was noted as being five men, though only two actually took part in the attack. No one had gotten a good enough look to give a specific description of the suspects, nor had anyone been able to ascertain exactly what type of vehicle they were driving. A sweep of the area for evidence didn't turn up much, though it has been reported that Donnie's wallet was found discarded not far from where he was attacked. Joe Cardona later explained to the Daily Record, quote, it happened so fast that people didn't have a chance to react. Something like this, the nature of this incident, was just so brazen, it might as well have happened in broad daylight. End quote. Investigators weren't sure where exactly they'd be looking for suspects. While they could have been from the area, the fact that they were unaware of the location of the nearby apartment complex suggested they were from out of town, or at least the main assailant was. Either that, or the entire question about where the apartment was had been asked purely to distract Donnie so that he could be attacked and robbed. This investigation, however, began as looking into an assault and robbery, but within hours, it would become a death investigation. At the medical center, Donnie was taken into surgery, but it was discovered he had sustained brain damage due to a loss of oxygen. The autopsy report would later state that, in addition to injuries to his head and stomach sustained during the assault, Donnie's right vertebral artery, a major blood vessel, had been ruptured. While the artery was able to be repaired, Donnie's brain had been deprived of oxygen for an extended period of time, and by midnight, less than three hours after the attack, the 19-year-old was placed on life support. Over the next hours, 
His family was faced with the incredibly difficult and grievous decision of whether or not to keep him on life support when medical advice suggested he would likely never wake up. Ultimately, Donnie was taken off life support and passed away at approximately 1.47 a.m. on Sunday, October 28th. At midnight, Rowan security system sent out text messages and emails to students informing them of the attack and notifying them to traveling groups and to stay vigilant. When the school was notified that Donnie had died, they began organizing an assembly in which they could discuss campus safety with students, as well as offering counseling services to those who needed it, and to begin plans for a memorial to be held for Donnie. The case was taken on by the major crimes unit of the Gloucester County Prosecutor's Office, as well as the Glassboro Police and the Rowan University Police. On the night Donnie was killed, investigators moved their focus to the Express Mart, where the suspects are believed to have been hanging out. They managed to interview an employee who was working that night, as well as obtain copies of surveillance footage shot inside the building. Footage taken moments before the murder depicted a single individual who authorities believe may have been involved in the attack. While they did not immediately release the footage, on Monday, October 29th, they issued both an artist composite as well as a physical description of the man. Investigators noted at the time, the man being sought was not considered a suspect, but rather a person they were hoping to speak with. The initial description, which will change over time, was given as that of a black or Hispanic male between the ages of 20 and 25, standing 5 feet 10 inches tall with a slim build. The man had light facial hair, described as slightly scruffy, as well as acne or pockmarks on his cheeks. His hair was described as being in cornrows and he was wearing a dark colored hat. It was noted that the man wore a distinctive hoodie with a British flag on the front left side. Two days later, the description was revised to be that of a black or Hispanic male, approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall, in his early 20s, with round facial features, braided hair, a thin mustache and goatee, wearing a dark hat, blue jeans, and a hoodie. Police explained that they had 12 witnesses who they had interviewed since the murder and that they were following up on several leads. Prosecutor Sean Dalton, when speaking to the Daily Record, went into some detail to specify the trajectory of the investigation and what they believed occurred, saying, quote, There is no gang involvement or any bias incident. We're not ruling out that there's a connection, but at this point, we don't believe so. Right now, we're focusing on the investigation at hand. It was a robbery, plain and simple. This was an extremely swift attack. It was unprovoked. It happened before anyone could provide assistance. End quote. That same Monday, more than 1,000 students were present for an assembly headed by University President Donald Farish to address security issues on campus. Multiple students raised issues regarding the slow notification about Donnie's murder through the security messaging system, as well as poor lighting at various locations on campus and an absence of safety training for students, among other problems. The assembly grew tense when several black students brought up the fact that they felt they were being looked at suspiciously and being questioned by investigators based purely on the fact that Donnie had been attacked by a black man or men when there was no evidence to link the assailants to the campus. Investigators said that they were following what leads they had received at that time, but this did little to alleviate the feeling of being targeted because of the color of their skin. On Tuesday, October 30th, Police stated that they had so far conducted 20 interviews, all based on calls they'd received from students, parents, and several anonymous tipsters. Two days later on Thursday, November 1st, it was announced that a $50,000 reward was being offered for information which could lead to an arrest and conviction. Prosecutor Dalton explained, quote, The investigation is still in its early stages. We hope this reward will speed this tragic episode to an arrest. End quote. In order to facilitate calls and tips, police established a 24-hour tip line as well as an email where people could submit tips anonymously. These programs were run through the Rowan Police, Gloucester Prosecutor's Office, and the Morris County Sheriff's Department, that being the county where Donnie had lived and grown up. With this reward offered, investigators received a slew of calls and emails, and by the next day they'd already questioned 40 people. 17 of which came from tips within the first hours of the hotline being opened. 
They also canvassed much of the neighborhood surrounding where the murder had occurred. In order to raise awareness about the murder, as well as the reward, more than 700 flyers were posted on campus and in the surrounding Glassboro area. An additional stack of flyers were sent north to Montclair State University because their team had played against Rowan that weekend and it was possible students had traveled to South Jersey to see the game. In addition, America's Most Wanted agreed to post the flyer on their website to help spread the word more quickly. Prosecutors also noted that, as of that time, 16 investigators were working the case full-time. On Friday, November 2nd, a viewing was held at the Par Troy Funeral Home in the town of Parsippany. More than 1,000 mourners attended, requiring a secondary hall to be opened to house everyone. Rowan University supplied bus transportation for students who wished to pay their respects, and according to the Courier-Post, the line for people to kneel beside Donnie's casket took more than an hour to move through, a testament to the vast number of people Donnie had touched in his short life. On Saturday the 3rd, Donnie was eulogized by Reverend Richard Carton, a family friend, and many people shared stories about their friend, brother, and son. Donnie was interred at the Gate of Heaven Cemetery in East Hanover. The following night, Sunday the 4th, hundreds of Rowan students gathered on Old Heston Road to hold a candlelight vigil. At 9.13 p.m., the time the 911 call was placed, they paused for a moment of silence, but there were some who wanted to do more. Several friends and students helped organize a website where they sold shirts, bracelets, and other merchandise honoring Donnie's life, with all funds to be directed to his family to help with funeral costs and medical bills. Multiple Facebook groups also popped up with the goal of spreading the word about Donnie's murder in hopes of tracking down the man or men who had attacked him that night. Two weeks later, investigators themselves would turn to the internet to try and reach more people by revealing a key piece of evidence which hadn't yet been shown. On Friday, November 16th, Prosecutor Dalton announced that the surveillance footage captured at the convenience store the night of the murder was to be posted on YouTube, where they hoped more people could get a look at the man they were seeking to question. The video shows a black or Hispanic male purchasing cigars from the clerk. The man is dressed in a gray hoodie with red sleeves and a dark Yankees baseball hat, which limits the camera's ability to get a directly clear shot of his face. As it turns out, the hoodie itself may be the key to identifying the man seen in the video. One of Donnie's friends, who was present the night he was killed, positively identified the man in the video as being the one who had attacked. At that time, he officially became a suspect. The hoodie itself is unique in a manner of speaking. Described as being a Kugi Heritage hoodie, only 50 were sold in the United States. Only two stores in New Jersey sold the hoodie, one in Jersey City and another in Plainfield. However, it was also available at several stores in New York City as well as via online shopping. It's described as having a gray body and red sleeves embroidered with the number 69. There's a decorative insignia displaying a Union Jack flag on the upper left chest. While investigators attempted to track down receipts for those who had purchased this hoodie, they weren't able to get their hands on all of that information. Those they did manage to track down were interviewed, but no one located was believed to have been the man they were looking for. In hopes that someone might recognize the buyer, flyers about Donnie's murder were put up in all the stores which sold the hoodie. At this time, investigators stated they were broadening their investigation to include Philadelphia, New York, and Delaware beyond New Jersey. By the end of the month, Police said they had tracked more than 70 leads across four states, though none had panned out. The next month, on Wednesday, December 12th, the prosecutor's office announced an increase in the reward being offered for information. The original reward of $50,000 was doubled to $100,000, the highest ever offered in Gloucester County. At the press conference in which this was announced, Prosecutor Dalton noted that there were three men in the group who were not involved in Donnie's murder, and it was their hope that one of them would come forward to claim the reward. Donnie's parents were present at the conference, and while they spoke about the increased reward, they chose not to discuss their son, the wounds still too fresh to address. Unfortunately, while investigators continued to work the case, tips were beginning to dry up, 
and the hunt for the killers was becoming more difficult. In January of 2008, America's Most Wanted ran a segment addressing Donnie's case, and for a time, this resulted in renewed calls from potential tipsters, but again, the leads developed only led to dead ends. By April, the prosecutor's office announced that in the six months since Donnie's murder, they had conducted more than 100 interviews, recorded 50 statements, and issued dozens of polygraph tests, all to no avail. Multiple agencies had gotten involved in assisting with the case, these being noted as the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force in Camden, the New Jersey State Police, the Prosecutor's Offices of Atlantic, Camden, Essex, and Cumberland Counties, the Cumberland Sheriff's Office, the Police Departments of Camden, East Orange, Buena, and Glassboro, as well as Rowan University and the Gloucester County Municipal Police. In hopes of bringing more attention, Donnie's family announced that they would be installing 10 billboards in both the South Jersey and Philadelphia areas. That same month, Mountain Lakes High School's baseball team held a ceremony to dedicate their season to Donnie. His family, including his sister Caitlin, who was on the team, were present and were given plaques commemorating the dedication. Donnie's mother, Kathy, threw out the first pitch of the season at what was a highly emotional event. Donnie's father, Donald Jr., was deeply moved, telling the Daily Record, quote, We appreciate that he's being remembered by the team in such a way. End quote. The next month, Booton Township officials dedicated a memorial to Donnie at the Rockaway Valley Aerodrome Fields, where he played ball as a youngster. A plaque bearing Donnie's image and a picture of a baseball cap like he always wore was placed just a few hundred feet from where he used to play. Inscribed was a quote, one which Donnie had written on an envelope of a letter he'd sent home to his family. It reads, quote, Other things may change us but we start and end with family, end quote. In response to Donnie's murder, as well as several other violent incidents on the campus at Rowan, the university announced they would be implementing several changes. According to the Daily Journal, three campus security officers were reclassified as police, giving them 17 armed police and 18 unarmed security officers. A canine officer was also added. There was an expansion on an already existing program which gave students the ability to be driven or chaperoned across campus and to off-campus residences between the hours of 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. Rowan also installed an additional 35 emergency phone boxes, raising the total number to 80. In July, the prosecutor's office announced that they were investigating and questioning known gang members for information about Donnie's murder. Bernie Weisenfeld, a spokesman for the office, explained, quote, What continues to happen is, when someone is arrested who is believed to be a street gang member, or someone already in jail is identified as a gang member, they are also questioned about the Farrell case and shown a flyer with the convenience store photo of the suspect. This is not to say the killing had anything to do with gangs. Rather, it implies that street gangs can be sources of information. End quote. Three months later in October, one year after Donnie's murder, investigators spoke with the Philadelphia Daily News and announced that they had conducted 200 interviews, executed multiple search warrants, and had tried to obtain the killer's DNA from the clothing Donnie was wearing the night he was killed. Unfortunately, that attempt failed to pull up any DNA. Police began to float a theory, considering the possibility that the men responsible for Donnie's death might not be aware that he'd been killed. It was noted that if they weren't from the area, they may have missed the initial media blitz covering the story. And since they hadn't used lethal weapons or seemingly planned to murder Donnie in the first place, they may not be aware they're wanted for murder. The investigation continued on, but there were no major developments or news announcements. It seemed as time passed, the suspect was disappearing into the ether. One more year would pass, two years after the murder, when investigators decided to reveal new details about the suspect. In October of 2009, the Gloucester County Prosecutor's Office released new information about the suspect captured on surveillance film and several interactions he had in the moments leading up to Donnie's murder. According to Sergeant Langdon Sills, 
The man seen in the footage identified himself to the convenience store clerk, giving a nickname, Smoke. The clerk told police that he saw Smoke outside the store near a dark, late-model Honda, possibly a four-door Accord, that had three women in the back seat and one male in the front. Sergeant Sills specified, quote, He wasn't occupying the vehicle. He wasn't driving the vehicle. He was near it and talking to these people in the car. End quote. The suspect also identified himself as Smoke to a female who had patronized the convenience store. According to the Courier Post, the suspect purchased cigars and stepped outside, lighting one, at which time a woman told him smoking was bad for him, and he replied, Well, that's what I do. I'm Smoke from AC. AC meaning Atlantic City, although it's considered possible he was not from Atlantic City and was just trying to make himself sound cool for the woman's benefit. The suspect, who I'll now refer to as Smoke, then asked the woman for her number. She declined, but said she would take his. Smoke then re-entered the store and wrote his number on the back of a lottery ticket, which he gave to the woman. Unfortunately, she didn't save the number, shockingly. When police managed to track her down, she allowed them to search her home, car, and the coat she was wearing that night, but it's believed she had disposed of the number at some point earlier. Investigators went so far as to run checks on her phone records, though they were never able to obtain Smoke's number, which might have given them the ability to finally identify him. In hopes of finding him through his nickname, more than 20 inmates who carry the nickname Smoke were interviewed, but none of them were the man seen in that surveillance footage. Two more years would pass, and in the fall of 2011, An investigative journalism class taught at Rowan University decided to focus on Donnie's case. The plan wasn't to try and solve the crime per se, but to report about Donnie's life, the crime, and the investigation. Throughout the class, both investigators working the case and members of Donnie's family made themselves available for interviews and to answer questions. It was difficult for Donnie's parents who, to that time, hadn't spoken very much about their loss in the public. When asked later by the Philadelphia Inquirer, Donald Jr. explained, quote, It was the first time we spoke about it publicly, as a family. It was hard to sit down with people to interview, but the class is a special tribute to Donnie. End quote. The work assembled through this class would become the backbone of the Donnie Project, which is full of articles written by students both during and after completion of the class. In 2017, 10 years after Donnie was murdered, investigators made a renewed push for information and to hopefully find the man they had been seeking for a decade. In June, Clear Channel Outdoor posted 38 digital billboards in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware showing the details of Donnie's case and posting the reward and number to call for information. This was done free of charge, in hopes that it might assist in bringing justice for a family that had endured such a heavy loss. Unfortunately, as of today, nearly 14 years since Donnie was killed, those who are responsible remain at large, and their identities unknown. The surveillance footage is available on YouTube, showing the suspect as he shops in the store, though both the presence of his hat and the low quality of the video make identifying his face difficult, if not impossible. The suspect's description remains the same today, a black or Hispanic male, standing 5 feet 7 inches tall, with a thin build, believed to have been between the ages of 20 and 24 at the time, he would now be between 34 and 38. He wore his hair braided beneath a New York Yankees baseball hat, navy in color. He has round facial features and at the time wore a thin mustache and light goatee. He also wore a Kugi heritage hoodie, gray on the body, with red sleeves and a Union Jack flag design. He referred to himself twice by the nickname Smoke and once claimed to have been from Atlantic City. A $100,000 reward remains in place for information leading to an arrest and conviction. Donald James Farrell III's life was taken from him when it was only just beginning. A bright, talented, and skilled athlete with a tremendous heart and a smile that never stopped created a lasting memory for those who knew and loved him. If alive today, Donnie would be 33 years old. 
What he may have become, where he would be now, is anyone's guess, though if you ask those who were lucky enough to have known him, they all say the same thing. That kid was going places. He had a bright future, and there was no limit to what he could have achieved. Though more than a decade has passed, no one has forgotten the bright-eyed baseball player who loved to laugh and sing along to his favorite band, 311. In fact, Great efforts have been made to ensure Donnie's name is never forgotten. An annual food drive is conducted in his honor, as is a lacrosse tournament beginning in 2013. A scholarship is awarded to a student each year who lives up to the kind of life Donnie tried to live by example. Throughout his hometown, white ribbons in the shape of infinity symbols are tied to trees, fences, front doors, and car grills a way of reminding people that Donnie will always be a part of that community. For his family, there are 19 years of wonderful memories, and despite their grief and pain, nothing can change the amazing moments they shared with their son and brother. There are no words I can speak that can possibly sum up the life and loss of Donnie Farrell, so I think it best to leave that to his mother, Kathy, who spoke about his life during a special presentation at a lacrosse tournament where the family received a framed commemorative jersey honoring Donnie. Just a note, the audio quality of these clips isn't very good. I've done my best to clean them up, so bear with me. For those that didn't know Donnie, Donnie was an amazing human being. He had a magnetic personality. He was friendly. He was kind. He was His baseball coach, when he was five years old, took his autograph. He said that Donnie would be something someday. And unfortunately, he only made it to 19. But I think that in those, he squeezed a lot into those 19 years to make his mark. Donnie loved growing. He loved it so much. Um, His sister, Caitlin, was supposed to go to Rowan that next September. She hadn't looked at any of the colleges. She was going to follow his, her big brother. When Donnie was murdered, my daughter Amy, who was 24 at the time, had to step in and become the parents because the parents were not uh, viable at the time. My son Luke was 15 at the time. Donnie was his big brother and his protector. So we've come this far. In the April of 2007, before Donnie was attacked in October, he was assaulted at an off-party campus. We didn't want Donnie to go back to Rowan, but he loved it here. He put so much work into the team, and he made so many friends that he came back. Donnie also left his mark by being an organ donor. Donnie's organ saved three people's lives, and he also helped others with his tissues. So the broken family that stands before you and Donnie's grandmother, we thank everybody for continuing to think about Donnie. The more that you think about Donnie, he can make us stronger. And that's why we're here today. So keep thinking of him. Thank you so much. Donnie Farrell was a smart, talented, caring, and kind 19-year-old with a reputation for being the type to go out of his way to help anyone. One day, he left for his sophomore year away at college and never came home. Instead, while offering directions to a group of men apparently in town for the big party weekend, he got attacked. By the time he hit the pavement, a major artery was ruptured, and even with police and medical assistance arriving less than 90 seconds later, he was dying and no one knew why. It wasn't until he was rushed into surgery that they discovered the problem, but by then, The extensive damage had been done, and his chances of survival were severely limited. Nineteen years, an entire life, everything he was, everything he may have become, destroyed in a matter of seconds. Yes, it was what you might refer to as a freak accident, a punch thrown that happens to land in the wrong place. A man dies as a result. Real life isn't like Hollywood, where people throw wild haymakers at each other for 15 minutes, and in the end, they've just got a black eye or bruised knuckles. In the real world, it doesn't take much of a punch to break your wrist or fingers, let alone how many millions of ways things can go wrong, and what began as a fight can end with a death. You never know how somebody's body might react, what injuries could occur, just how quickly something that seems small can become so massive. 
There's a slew of manslaughter cases out there where two guys got into it at a bar, stepped outside, and one punch ended it for both of them. Is it really worth the possibility of murder, of taking someone's life because they insulted you, spilled a drink, or didn't answer a question the way you wanted? Don't get me wrong, if necessary, self-defense is warranted, but I've known far too many people whose lives were ruined and didn't have to be. If only they'd taken the time to weigh the consequences, let things cool down. While all of those situations are dangerous in their own right, when it comes to Donnie's death, it's completely different. This wasn't about two people squaring off, some deep-seated dispute, defending a friend or a weaker person. This was a blindside ambush, a sneak attack that left a son and brother dead. And over what? A wallet and a cell phone? Have you ever met a college student living away from home? I'd be shocked if that wallet had $20 in it. Maybe that's why it was found not far from the scene. How much pain and grief has been felt over something so seemingly insignificant? It truly is a tragedy something senseless that destroyed so much. The murder of Donnie Farrell isn't like most cases covered on Trace Evidence. There isn't a big mystery about what happened, who was involved, and why. We know two people were involved. We just don't know who they are. Despite surveillance footage, a hoodie that was made in a limited run, a nickname, a physical description, and a possible destination, the men who robbed Donnie and in the process murdered him have never been identified. Somehow, over the course of nearly 14 years, no one's been able to directly implicate who it may have been. For investigators, it comes down to a fairly basic question. Do the men who attacked Donnie even know that their assault resulted in his death? Assuming they weren't from the area, that they came from further away, they may not have learned what happened. Living in southern New Jersey, it was in all the papers. It made the headlines in Philadelphia. But I didn't find any New York articles about it, nor did I find any in Delaware. Almost all the papers that wrote about this case, at least beyond printing an associated press blurb, can be found within 50 miles of Rowan University. So sure, there's a chance the killers don't know that they're wanted for this crime, but how has no one come forward to name them yet? There were three people present, three people who weren't involved. Apparently these guys were friends of the two who attack. Everyone appears to have fled together in the same dark colored car, perhaps a late model Honda Accord. Someone must have learned what happened, and even if none of the five ever did, people talk. You're telling me that in 14 years, not one of those guys has ever told a friend about what he saw or perhaps bragged about robbing a kid near Rowan University one night? I think it's safe to assume more than those five guys know this story. So why hasn't anyone reported it? Why hasn't anyone tried to cash in on the $100,000 reward that's available? In a lot of cases, police believe while the longer a case goes unsolved, the harder it becomes to solve, there are some advantages to the passage of time. Primarily, people who were friends may separate, significant others leave or get angry, people in your life who were once close become distant, and at some point may decide it's worth going for the money, and through doing so, punishing the person they feel wronged them. Strangely, that hasn't happened here. I honestly don't know if it's as a result of no one turning on these guys or a simple lack of knowledge about the murder. This is a massive case, one which has received pretty good coverage, if you live in New Jersey or Philadelphia. Once you leave the area, there's no mention anywhere. New York City is 100 miles away, and there's no headlines, no articles, no notices. Nothing. I suppose that's where you come in. If you're listening to this episode, While I don't imagine the vast majority of you know the person responsible for this crime, you possess the ability to spread the word about it so that maybe someone who does know will finally learn the truth, see the light, and be moved to act, or hell, just want to cash in on $100,000. Frankly, if it's all about the money, I don't think anyone's going to complain as long as the information given is accurate and legitimate. How many of you live in the Northeast? New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland? At least a few, right? Were you aware of this case before you listened to this episode? I'd really like to know. I'd like to see how far this story traveled, how far it reached. The answer to that question might help explain why someone hasn't placed a call or given the right tip yet. The absence of forensic evidence makes it all the more difficult. No DNA, apparently, no fingerprints. Even if this guy got arrested later on an unrelated crime, there'd be no way of knowing it was him unless someone recognized him and connected the dots or happen to ask the right questions at the right time. 
How have none of this guy's associates been popped for a crime and been willing to deal for a lesser sentence by giving out information on an unsolved homicide? They say there's no honor among thieves, and that I believe, but this may be a case where reputation plays a big role. Some people view silence and blind loyalty as signs of honor, but in reality, anyone who would protect someone who did this has no honor. You threw the punch. You caused another person's death. You believe you're big, tough, a badass, but you're too scared to face the consequences of your actions. Just another coward pretending to be something you can never be. We often hear the cliches like be a man or man up, but unfortunately a lot of these so-called big bad men are children. Weak little fragile things who value street cred over valor, ambushes over direct confrontation, running over standing tall. I surely don't aim to smear every man with this label because we've seen there are good people in the world, people who stand up for what's right, people willing to sacrifice for the better result. Donnie was one of those people, someone who would have given the shirt off his back to someone in need, and now he lies in a grave while the cowards who ended his life continue to live on with no conscience, no concern, no worry, and no regrets, at least not publicly. I don't know what lies they spout when showing off for their friends or trying to impress or threaten someone, but I imagine that mirror can be somewhat difficult to look into when you know deep down at your core you're nothing more than a weak, cowardly punk and the reputation you value so strongly is all based on a lie. There's not a lot to say about it. There's not a lot to analyze. It was mindless. I read a profile that was made up for the man we know as Smoke, but in all honesty, there wasn't much to it. Likely from within 100 miles of Rowan, but not a local. More than likely into drugs, probably marijuana, based on the nickname and the purchase of the brand of cigars more associated with making blunts than actually smoking the cigar itself. Right-handed, based on footage of him writing down his number for the two women he was flirting with. It's pretty basic. I'd wager this guy has probably been picked up a time or two over the years for small crimes, theft, possession. Maybe he graduated to big boy crimes, armed robbery, assault, maybe another murder. But he's a small-time criminal, and if he hasn't been killed or arrested by now, it's only a matter of time. There's the rare possibility that he straightened out his life, gotten away from a past of crime and violence, but is still harboring this secret, still too afraid to face the truth and in turn face justice. So it comes down to all of you. We may not be able to solve this crime. We may not be able to go out and make an arrest or track down Smoke and his friends, but with the power of social media, we can make sure his face, his description, and that hoodie are everywhere. I'll be posting some images along with the release of this episode. I'll provide the link to the surveillance footage. Share it everywhere. Spread the word. Get Donnie's story out there and maybe, just maybe, Someone might see a flyer, the video, the hoodie, and remember a story they were told about a guy and his friends who robbed a kid near Rowan University on homecoming weekend in 2007. We've seen 50-year-old cases solved through DNA, through witnesses coming forward, through sheer luck and force of will. They can find a way to return the names to unidentified victims found decades ago, locate missing children hundreds of miles from home, identify suspects who have gone into hiding, change their names and appearances. There's no way in hell that together, the true crime community as a whole can't help identify this so-called smoke. Someone knows that name. Someone knows that hoodie. You may have gone to school with them, worked with them, gotten into trouble with them. Maybe you rode the bus and he sat nearby, hopped on the subway and he was there, went to a party and shared a smoke. I'd be willing to bet there's a decent amount of people out there who have been threatened by him, assaulted by him, targeted by him. He's already killed once that we know of. How many more people have to die? How many more lives destroyed before someone steps up and says enough? He's just another spineless bully. The kind we hear so much about today. The kind of guy who cheats, lies, steals, targets those who can't defend themselves or aren't prepared for the attack. Together. We might not be able to change the world, but we can find justice. Maybe he didn't mean to kill Donnie. Maybe he didn't know that's what would happen. I mean, how could you? Who would expect it to go this way? And maybe that's the case, but that doesn't bring Donnie back. It doesn't change what happened, and it doesn't offer his family any moment's peace or comfort. They're good people with strong hearts and good values who worked hard to raise their children to do what was right. 
I'm in no position to say they could find forgiveness in their hearts for this guy, but I'm willing to bet they'd try, if not for themselves, then for what they believe Donnie would have done. Stepping forward could be the first move to silencing that voice screaming in the back of your mind, your one chance to make a difference. Donnie Farrell was 19 when his life was cut short. In less than two decades, he impacted the lives of hundreds. News articles, Facebook groups, websites, food drives, lacrosse tournaments, dedications, memorials. Lives saved because he chose to be an organ donor. Even in death, he continues to be the impetus for so much designed to help others. We'll never know what he could have become, where he'd be now, and what he'd be doing. Everyone saw a bright future for the kid with a strong work ethic, a big heart, and of course a smile that can never be forgotten. I didn't have the chance to know Donnie. He'd have been 33 years old now, a little younger than me. When he was a kid on Staten Island, I was 80 miles away on Long Island. When he was living in Booton, I was living just 50 miles away. He was murdered in October of 2007, and not long after, I left New York. I never heard his name or his story until years later. I didn't know Donnie, but in a way I knew the type. I had a friend who sounded just like him. Smart, fun-loving, athletic, talented. The kind of guy who would do anything for you. He's gone now, too, a victim of a senseless act for which there's no resolution, but I still think about him every day. I hear his laugh and I see his smile. I imagine it's like that for Donnie's parents, for his siblings, for his friends. There's no way to assuage the pain of their loss, but perhaps together we can give some comfort in reminding them that Donnie isn't forgotten and his killer will always have to look over his shoulder wondering if today is the day that someone finally recognizes him. Dr. Erwin Yalom, a famed psychiatrist and author, has a line that's often and frequently misquoted. In the book Love's Executioner and Other Tales of Psychotherapy, he wrote, quote, Someday soon, perhaps in 40 years, there will be no one alive who has ever known me. That's when I will truly be dead, when I exist in no one's memory. I thought a lot about how someone very old is the last living individual to have known some person or a cluster of people. When that person dies, the whole cluster dies too, vanishes from the living memory. I wonder who that person will be for me, whose death will make me truly dead. End quote. Memory, sometimes, is the best we can give to ensure someone isn't gone. We may lose those we love, but so long as they live within us, They're not truly gone. For Donnie, for every case out there of a murder or disappearance, solved or not, we have the power to keep their names in the spotlight, to keep telling their stories and in our own way, to ensure they never get the opportunity to die a second time. I can always tell the stories, but I need you to make sure they keep finding new listeners, new people to learn about them. So let's do what we can. Use the hashtag Justice for Donnie. Share the pictures, the video, the description. Everyone. Because the sad truth is, without the man in the surveillance video being located and identified, a tip from someone close to the case or some other major break, the murder of Donnie Farrell will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Donnie Farrell, there are many sources available online. The Donnie Project is a great one, and the story was extensively covered by the Philadelphia Daily News, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Morristown Daily Record. If you have any information about the murder of Donnie Farrell, please contact the Gloucester County Prosecutor's Office at 856 384 56 04. You can also directly call Detective Warren Ravel at 856-384-5625. You can also call the Rowan University Police at 856-256-4564. You can text anonymous tips to GLOWTIP 456-847 or to CRIMES 274 637. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, 
Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, James, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Kevin Bonham, Marla Wright, Melissa Brekhuizen, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levinen, Sarah Mascaritolo, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Vox Nihili. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening, sharing the show, and helping keep these cases alive. I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.